really why um, you're different from your dog or your cat. That is to say, humans engage in trade and barter all the time. Whether this propensity is one of those original principles in human nature, of which no further account can be given, or whether, as seems more probable, it be the, necess the necessary consequence of the faculties of reason and speech, it belongs not to our present subject to inquire. It is common to all men, and to be found in no other race of animals, which seem to know neither this nor any other species of contracts. In other words, his argument is simple. This is what makes us fundamentally special. The difference, he continues a little later in this chapter, the difference of natural talents in different men is in reality much less than we are aware of, and the very different genius which appears to distinguish men of different professions when grown up to maturity is not upon many occasions so much the cause as the effect of the division of labor. The difference between the most dissimilar characters, between a philosopher and a common street porter, for example, seems to arise not so much from nature as from habit, custom, and education. In other words, you are, we can say this collectively, although it's, we take it tongue-in-cheek, you are your money, but that's because your money, your wealth, buys education. You are your education. Okay, we'll come back to it again. Uh, chapter 3 will um, be called that the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. Trade, he argues, can only happen if other people need or want the products that are created. Your job is limited to where you live, right? You can't have farmers, for example, living in the middle of downtown London. And, 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 like, and likewise, notice your manufacturing always seems to happen around cities, right? Also, you got to be near water if you're going to really build wealth. The key to civilization is shipping. Think about the major um, cities, right? Um, the Nile, he mentions. The Ganges will be mentioned. Obviously, in the American experience, we'll think about the Mississippi River. And that is to say, always, uh, water matters. Just to jump in now to one uh, set of lines, since such, therefore, are the advantages of water carriage, it's natural that the first improvements of art and industry should be made where this conveniency opens the whole world for a market to the produce of every sort of labor, and that they should always be much later in extending themselves into the inland parts of the country. In other words, take a look at a map, look at the major waterways, and you will find the major cities somehow always close to that, and that's where the major wealth is as well. Right? Of course, everything that he's saying will be read a hundred years after 1776 and 1876, a hundred years into the experience of the independent colonies of the Americas, right? Ultimately, that United States of America. We'll look at this kind of thing and they will pay attention to the fact that, you know what, he's absolutely right. I mean, yeah, that Hudson River produces some important kind of wealth around, uh, around metropolises as, of course, we think about what happens along up and down the Mississippi River, later the Missouri River, and on it goes, right? Uh, chapter 4, um, the origin and use of money. And for the first time, he'll begin to ask the question, why does money exist? And, uh, for example, a coat maker can't just trade for potatoes, right? Um, it is a convenience, he says, that allows trade to be easier. Metal is used, he says, it's scarce and it's durable, but it also has to be weighed. Um, a couple of uh, passages here, every man thus lives by exchanging or becomes, in some measure, a merchant and the society itself grows to be what is properly a commercial society. Continuing, the butcher has more meat in his shop than he himself can consume, and the brewer and the baker would each of them be willing to purchase a part of it. But they have nothing to offer in exchange except the different productions of their respective trades, and the butcher is already provided with all the bread and beer which he has immediate occasion for. No exchange can, in his case, be made between them. Um, um, the the uh, other passage that I want to read to you. Um, it is in this manner that money has become in all civilized nations the universal instrument of commerce by the invention of which goods of all kinds are bought and sold or exchanged for one another. What are the rules which men naturally observe in exchanging them either for money or for one another I shall now proceed to examine. These rules determine what may be called the relative or exchangeable value of goods. The word value, it's to be observed, has two different meanings, and sometimes expresses the utility of some particular object, and sometimes the power of purchasing other goods which the possession of that object conveys. The one may be called value and use, the other value and exchange. 
The things which have the greatest value and use have frequently little or no value in exchange. And on the contrary, those which have the greatest value in exchange have frequently little or no value in use. Nothing is more useful than water, but it will purchase scarce anything. Scarce anything can be had in exchange for it. Obviously, Smith writing at a time when the idea of water was so prevalent that, especially clean water, so prevalent that no one really had to worry about, uh, about dirty water. Today, of course, we read these lines as a bit ironic. For example, he says this, though. A diamond, on the contrary, has scarce any value in use, but a very great quantity of other goods may frequently be had in exchange for it. In order to investigate the principles which regulate the, ex the, the exchangeable value of commodities, I will endeavor to show first what is the real measure of this exchangeable value or where it consists of the real price of all commodities. Secondly, what are the different parts of which this real price is composed or made up? And lastly, notice how clean the writing is, the prose. Very easy to read, very easy to follow. And lastly, what are the different circumstances which sometimes raise some or all of these different parts of price above and sometimes sink them below their natural or ordinary rate? Or what are the causes which sometimes hinder the market price, that is, the actual price of commodities from coinciding exactly with what may be called their natural price? It's at this point that we turn to chapter 5. Um, and the title here, of the real and nominal price of commodities or of their price in labor and their price in money. Um, he, he will say, the rich can purchase more stuff than the poor. This, of course, sounds kind of, uh, intuitive, right? But he says, money buys labor. All value for Smith is somehow connected to work or labor, so put that in your notes, that's important. But then, real value is connected um, of, to our other things we're willing to exchange for. It. The nominal value, the amount of money we pay, can go up or down. The real value, the amount of necessary things like food, shelter, that you can get for it, right? Real, if you will, needs of life. The opening lines of chapter 5. Every man is rich or poor, according to the degree to which he can afford to enjoy the necessaries, conveniences, and amusements of human life. When we studied our Henry David Thoreau's Walden, he said a man is rich in proportion to the uh, things he can live without, no question, we have a very interesting debate between the two. What is actual wealth? What is riches? Thoreau said it's what you can live without. Uh, Smith is a little more, you know, kind of real life, real world, and he says, you know, you're basically wealthy in proportion to the things you can purchase, right? He says, wealth, as Mr. Hobbes says, is power, as opposed to what is attributed, at least to Bacon, knowledge is power, wealth is power, according to Mr. Hobbes. Remember Hobbes, of course, that colleague of Smith so important. But the person who either acquires or succeeds to a great fortune does not necessarily acquire or succeed to any political power, either civil or military. He will point out later that it is often the case, however, that people who uh, have money often have power, political, military power, and the like. One other uh, line he says, in the progress of industry, commercial nations have found it convenient to coin several different metals into money gold for larger payments, silver for purchases of moderate value, and copper, or some other coarse metal, for those of still smaller consideration. We turn next to uh, Book 1, Chapter 6. So let's go there quickly, and the full title of that one, of the competent parts of the price of commodities. And he asks this question, why do some jobs pay more than other jobs? It's kind of funny, right? I mean, think about it if you're going to, for example, um, just declare a major in school. Why is it that if tonight you go home and tell your folks, I've decided when I go to college I'm going to major in poetry, as opposed to what I was going to do, pre-med or engineering, they will say something like, well, poetry is nice, but, I mean, why is it some jobs get more money? He's going to ask this question. In early societies, he said, he says, workers kept all their profits, but with the rise of bosses or landlords, then you have the gaining of wealth. Three things, he says, makes up the price of any product, right? And of course, also the wealth of any nation. You have the labor it took to make it. You have the profit the company wants to make. And you have the rent the company is charging or uh, uh, on uh, charging on buildings and or technologies and machines. A couple of uh, passages here. He says this. The real value of all the different component parts of price, it must be observed, is measured by the quantity of labor which they can, each of them, purchase or command. Labor measures the value not only of that part of price which resolves itself into labor, but of that which resolves itself into rent and that which resolves itself into profit. In every society, the 
price of every commodity finally resolves itself into some one or other or all of those three parts. And in every improved society, all the three enter more or less as component parts into the price of the far greater part of the commodities. A, syn a kind of synthetic view of, e of economy then. In the price of corn, for example, one part pays the rent of the landlord, another pays the wages or maintenance of the laborers and the laboring cattle employed in producing it, in other words. And the third part pays the profit of the farmer. Um, one other passage, he says, whoever derives his revenue from a fund, which is his own, must draw it from either his labor, from his stock, or from his land. The revenue derived from labor is called wages. That derived from stock by the person who manages or employs it is called profit. Notice again, just clean language, right? That derived from it by the person who does not employ it himself but lends it to another is called the interest or the use of money. Now that notion of usury versus interest and all of that, we'll, we'll hear a little bit about this, okay, as we, as we get into this, into this. Let's jump now to uh, chapter 7, um, quickly, of the natural and market price of commodities. He says, market price of labor is the average wage determined by laws of supply and demand. Natural price of a product is how much people actually want the product. I mean, you create something and nobody actually wants it, right? A monopoly the nominal or the money price state to separate uh, the, uh, to, from the natural price, right? And prices tend to stay or hover around the natural price. He says it this way. The actual price at which any commodity is commonly sold is called its market price. It may either be above or below or actually the same with its natural price. He continues, a very poor man may be said in some sense to have a demand for a coach and six he might like to have it, but his demand is not an effectual demand, as the, com as the commodity can never be bar uh, brought to market in order to satisfy it. Uh, Smith is not without his sense of, of humor, we might say. Chapter 8, um, of the wages of labor. Most people, of course, work for a boss or a master, right, and therefore gain wages. Bosses, therefore, can often collude. They can get together and drive wages down because they don't want to pay, obviously, as much. Workers, obviously, can collude, get together, and drive wages up, especially through unions and striking and that kind of thing. Smith says that they don't really work, however, long term. This will be a subject of huge debate, obviously, in our study of uh, American economics, right, and European economics as well, right? The growth of a country, think about America in 1776, he'll have a lot to say about this in Wealth of Nations and the Colonies, as he calls them our colonies, because he's British, right? The growth of a, co of, a, of, a, of a country and the colonies is actually more important than its specific richness, okay? Wages in England are rising because cost of living is going down, he argues. Wage laborers are actually more important and greater than slaves. Here, here again, he'll make several comments about slaves. He says, the problem with slaves is that if they get sick, you still gotta, you got to pay money to take care of them, right? And slaves, of course, he argues, has, have no true incentive to work other than survival. The need of a standard work week, he argues, as well, with weekends off so that workers can rest, is also necessary, which makes Smith already pretty futuristic, right? Here's some uh, lines um, from Chapter 8. He says... Such cases, however, are not very frequent, and in every part of Europe, 20 workmen serve under a master for one that is independent, and the wages of labor are everywhere understood to be what they usually are when the laborer is one person and the owner of the stock which employs him another. What are the common wages of labor depends everywhere upon the contract usually made between those two parties, whose interests are by no means the same. The workmen desire to get as much the masters to give as little as possible. So there is a tension, in other words. The former are disposed to combine in order to raise the latter in order to lower the wages of labor. Um, he continues uh, a few paragraphs later by saying it this way, but though North America is not yet as rich as England, it is much more thriving and advancing with much greater rapidity to the further acquisition of riches. The most decisive mark of the propensity of any country is the increase of the number of its inhabitants. In Great Britain and most other European countries, they are not supposed to double in less than 500 years. In the British colonies in North America, it's been found that they double in 20 or 5 and 20 years. The dynamic growth, he says, is going to lead to important stuff. He says a little bit later, the value of children is the greatest of all encouragements to marriage. We cannot therefore wonder that the people in North America should generally marry very young. Notwithstanding the great increase occasioned by such early marriages, 
there is a continual complaint of the scarcity of hands in North America. The demand for laborers, the funds distant from maintaining them, increase it seems still faster than they can find laborers to employ. That dynamic growth that was happening in the colonies, we get a, a strong sense of in Wealth of Nations. He continues by giving an example from elsewhere. Look at this one. I said he was very cosmopolitan. China has been long one of the richest. That is, one of the most fertile, most cultivated, most industrious, and most populous countries in the world. It seems, however, to have been long stationary. Marco Polo, who visited it more than 500 years ago, describes his cultivation, industry, and populousness almost in the same terms in which they are described by travelers in the present times. Okay? And, uh, uh, of course, this has always been the debate about China as a nation of industry. Does it, is it always thriving, or is it, is it somewhat more static, right? Um, a couple of other passages that I've marked that I like to read for you. No society can surely be flourishing and happy. It's interesting that he would use the word happy, and of course Jefferson in Declaration of Independence will also use the word happy or happiness. No society can surely be flourishing and happy of which the great, far greater part of the members are poor and miserable. We're going to hear this over and over again. When you have a large number of people who are extremely poor and miserable, you cannot have a thriving nation. It is but equity, besides, that they who feed, clothe, lodge the whole body of the people should have such a share of the produce of their own labor as to be themselves tolerably well-fed, clothed, and lodged. It's an important idea, and it's, I think, one that probably we do well to pay attention to today, right? One final passage um, from chapter 8. The liberal reward of labor, as it encourages the propagation, so it increases the industry of the common people. The wages of labor are the encouragement of industry, which, like every other human quality, improves in proportion to the encouragement it receives. A plentiful subsidence increases the bodily strength of the laborer and the comfortable hope of bettering his condition and the end of ending his days perhaps in ease and plenty animates him to exert that strength to the utmost. We're always kind of planning for the future, right? Where wages are high, accordingly, we shall always find the workmen more active, diligent, and, exp and, 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 and expeditious uh, than where they are low. In England, for example, than in Scotland. In other words, you, uh, if, if you're not receiving a good wage, you have no real reason to want to work harder. Therefore, that notion of a minimum wage and the increase of a minimum wage here, he's going to argue that's always been a tension, but it's always an important one, no question. Chapter 9 of the profits of stock, he comments on this one. The more stuff a company produces, the quicker profits will drop, right? The more people there are producing stuff, the more competition. This is a huge one for Smith. Write that down. Competition is huge, right? Um, and, and, and then, of course, prices have to drop to get buyers, if that's not the case. The wealthier nations are open to trade with international competition. That one is a big one for Smith as well. A couple of lines, uh, just the opening, right at the opening of chapter 9, he says this, The increase of stock, which raises wages, tends to lower profit. When the stocks of many rich merchants are turned into the same trade, their mutual competition naturally tends to lower its profit. And where there is a like increase of stock in all the different trades carried on in the same society, the same competition must produce the same effect in them all. Then a few lines later, profit is so very fluctuating that the person who carries on a particular trade cannot always tell for himself what is the advantage, uh, or what is the average of his annual profit. Um, and then just a few lines later, he says it this way, it may be laid down as a maxim, for wherever a great deal can be made by the use of money, a great deal will commonly be given for the use of it, and that wherever little can be made of it, less will commonly be given for it. On to chapter number 10. Let's look at that one now briefly. It's an important chapter. I wish I had more time to go through this one in detail. Um, the title of the chapter of Wage and Profit in the Different Employments of Labor and Stock. He says, there are five reasons some jobs pay better. Okay, And this again takes us back to that. Why is it that majoring as an engineer is going to get you more money than majoring as a poet, for example? Okay. Um, the uh, First of all, the five. Just to, just to kind of um, to, to get you there. Five, um, the unpleasantness of the job, we have to consider. Two, the difficulty or the ease of the job. Three, the scarcity of the job, right? The fewer number of people, obviously, the more you get paid. Uh, four, the responsibility of the job. And then finally, the likelihood of succeeding at the job, okay? All of this will then play its significant role. 
Um, and, and the way he says this is that the five following are the principal circumstances which, so far as I've been able to observe, make up for a small personary gain in some employments and counterbalance a great one in others. First, the agreeableness or disagreeableness of the employments themselves. Secondly, the easiness and cheapness or the difficulty and experience of learning them. Third, thirdly, the constancy or inconstancy of employment in them. Fourthly, the smaller grade trust with which uh, which must be reposed in those who exercise them, and fifthly, the probability or improbability of success in them. Um, that, that notion then is that when we're young, we often, he says, will pick jobs that we think we might like, and then we end up finding out later these are not good paying jobs, and therefore we end up not having the wealth that we would so wish to have, right? Um, he says about playing with stocks that it's a form of gambling. He'll say this several times in Wealth of Nations, and therefore it's, it's, it's pretty dangerous to play, you know, to play around with, uh, with that one. Um, and then we move to part two. In part two, we've got this, um, we got this really interesting um, title um, that, I'll, that I'll give to you, Inequalities Occasioned by the Policy of Europe. Right? In other words, now we're going to get kind of a, of a study of, of Europe. And here we're going to hear about how Smith is opposed to government regulations. He says you shouldn't discourage competition. You have to have competition if you're going to have wealth. Um, he gives a carpenter example, for example. Seven years of apprentice work, he says, is really not necessary. It's more to protect the, wa the wages of carpenters. Um, there is a natural tension, he goes on to talk about, between the country and farmers and the town and the bankers, right? Because the bankers can unite to kind of control in some ways the farmers. Government regulations as well on imports are bad because people have to pay more. He says government regulations are not letting people move from job to job and he says that also is bad. And he says finally if businesses can move where they want, so should.